and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I am not joined by Taylor Rockwell today. Instead, I'll be talking to John D. Halloran about the US women's national team. John is a knowledgeable writer covering all things US soccer, and because the US women's national team is about to begin their World Cup qualification process, I thought it was a great time to talk to him. It's the CONCACAF Women's Championship. That's the World Cup qualification process, and it's happening in Cary, North Carolina, starting this week. Two groups of four, top two in each group go to the semifinals, the winners go to the final. Both finalists qualify for next summer's World Cup, as does the winner of the third place playoff. For the group stage, the US has been drawn with Mexico, Panama and Trinidad and Tobago. The first US game versus Mexico is this Thursday, October 4th to 7.30pm Eastern kickoff and it's live on Fox Sports 2. Taylor and I will be watching and reviewing that game on Thursday night. But first, to get prepped, have a listen to my conversation with John D. Halloran. We talk about the evolution of the US tactics and formation over the past couple of years, the likely starting lineups, the relative strength of the opposition in the CONCACAF Championship, and the little things to look out for with this US national team. So I'm joined on the phone by John D. Halloran. John, hello and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Uh, we're very happy to have you. John, you are, you're one of my favorite U.S. Women's National Team writers. I, my understanding is that you are, you are freelance, but I, I've seen your work with uh, Equalizer. I've seen it with American Soccer Now. Is there anywhere else you've been writing that I'm not aware of? Uh, Yanks are coming occasionally as well. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, with, uh, with Neil and John. Correct. Yeah. All right. So, um, so the first thing I want to ask you about with the, with the Women's National Team is the tactical evolution that we've seen since uh, that day in 2016 when the US team could not break down the Swedish team my because you know I've watched from a distance I haven't been sort of heavily involved in the details my understanding is that Jill Ellis has tried a few different things and has settled on a sort of 4-3-3 but I'm hoping you can maybe talk us through how we got there and what it looks like yeah so after what happened in the Olympics Ellis had decided that she needed to push another player into the attack. So in the fall of 2016, she moved the team into a three back. They went through a couple of evolutions of that um, in, a, in a few series of friendlies. But then in the spring of 2017, they played in the She Believes Cup and they were utterly dominated by France in the final game of that tournament. Coming out of that... Oh, Alex, was that? Which, sorry to cut you off. Was that with um, Ali Long playing center center back? Yes, it was. Yes, I remember that game. Okay. Yeah, so there is. You, you could certainly have a discussion about whether it was the fault of the formation or whether Ellis had maybe selected the wrong personnel uh, to try that out. As you mentioned, Ali Long, who normally um, plays as a center midfielder and, and kind of you know made waves as an attacking center mid, was playing center back in that formation. Yeah. Uh, and then in the spring, she moved the team to a four four two. Uh, they played a couple of friendlies. They went they went over to Europe and won a couple of games. But then in the in the late summer of 2017, they lost a friendly to Australia. And coming out of that game is when Ellis first decided to play with the 4-3-3. And that was about 15 months ago now, and they haven't lost since. Is so uh, last time we talked to US Women's National Team on this show, it was my co-host Taylor interviewing uh, Steph Yang. And Steph mm-hmm. made reference to um, a Grant Wall Sports Illustrated story about an attempted player revolt, which seemed to be around 2017. So I don't know if you know any details about that, but is, was any of that related to the playing style? And could this 4-3-3 be a result of, of that sort of that conversation that happened? I think they're certainly related. Um, that, that reported player revolt actually happened right around that loss to Australia. There was a lot of frustration. Uh, with results, with even though, and then even even when they switched to a four four two, the team was winning again, but very static, um, really unimpressive offensive displays. There was obviously a lot of turnover in the lineup, and I know, you know, with the U.S. and and the veterans that they have, sometimes there's unhappiness when the roster starts to turn over. Yeah. Um, so I think all of those things were related. 
So what does the current 433 looks like? Assuming that everybody listening knows basically what a 433 looks like. Um I did I think I did see now uh, on Yanks are coming. I believe it was you wrote uh a story and you had a very nice diagram of you know the various movements within that 433. So do you mind if we get detailed right. about sort of who does what within that system? Yeah, so in the midfield, um generally Julie Ertz is the centerpiece of that um, playing a little bit deeper than the other two. Um, and then they've rotated a little bit, but Lindsay Horan uh, has often played as the right center mid. She tends to drift out to the right flank a little bit to find space. Um, and then whoever is at that left center mid often plays in, in more of an eight um, or 10 role, kind of trying to connect the lines. Um, but that also changed when they played um, at the end of the Tournament of Nations, when Rose Lavelle came in, Rose Lavelle playing in that right center mid played a much more attacking role from that side of the field. What, what do we have going on up front? Because in my head, it's always Alex Morgan at center forward. Um, and then it seems like it's some combination of uh, Mallory Pugh, Megan Rapino, Tobin Heath and Kristen Press um, out wide. Do, do we have an idea of who's the favored two starters and what their roles are? I think right now um, the best two uh, in those wide positions are probably Heath and Rapino. But as you mentioned, when you have Mallory Pugh and Kristen Press on the bench, you know you, you're you're going to find a way to use those players when you can. Is that is that a John D. Halloran favored lineup, or is that what you expect Gillelis to go with? Let's say in the first World Cup qualifier or Concacaf Championship or both um, against Mexico uh, later this week. I think Rapino is a lock. I think the the other flank, whether it's Mallory Pugh or Tobin Heath, is probably a bit of a toss up. Um, but Pugh is coming off of an injury, so I do think that Heath has the inside track right now. And what um what do we get from Rapino out wide? I'm I'm always kind of fascinated by Megan Rapino because when I think of all the other players who play wide, um they offer some sort of direct running, right? Like I know maybe you wouldn't call right. Tobin Heath the fastest, but she's definitely got the tricks to go past people. Uh, Pew and Press can go past people. I always think of Rapino as a, a slightly different player. So I'm wondering what it looks like uh, what, if you watch her consistently play on the wing for the US. I think the biggest thing that she provides is service. Um, she can whip in a ball in a way that I don't think anybody else in the player pool can. Um, she has that ability to, to put a ball in behind a center back, but still leave it, um, far enough out from the goalkeeper that the center forward or the opposite wing can get on the end of it. Yeah. Um, and, and her brain is something special. It's something, you know, not to belabor it, but there's kind of an American style of speed and fitness, uh, that has kind of characterized this team for a long time. And, and Rapino does not necessarily fit into that mold. She has a way of seeing the game, much like Tobin Heath, that is atypical for an American player in that they see the game, they see the field, they see the space, uh, in a way that I think a lot of Americans haven't over, over the last 20 years. And I'd, I'd obviously classify her as, you know, one of the, the veterans, right? The players who've been around the longest. Um, I also see, for example, uh, uh, Alex Morgan as a veteran, but I, I, don't, I don't remember Alex Morgan as the ideal target, like, like Abby Wambach was, right? I always remember Megan Rapino whipping in those crosses and Wambach would be on the end of it. Um, do we now have Alex Morgan as a sort of target forward for those crosses? I, I, I think absolutely. I think going all the way back to 2012 in the Olympics when Morgan scored a header against Canada, I think people have always undervalued her ability in the air. And I really think in this system with her as the center forward, you've seen her hold up play really develop, not only in the air, but even with her back to pressure, her ability to hold the ball and then find Pew or Rapino or Heath on those overlaps in the wide spaces. That's something that's really impressed me over the past year. And what is, I noticed we haven't said Carly Lloyd's name uh, yet. And obviously she's a player that many, many people will be very familiar with. Um, my understanding is she, she's basically not in the starting 11, but she is um, on this World Cup qualifying roster. And presumably she has a very good shot of, if all goes well, going to the World Cup next summer. So what is Carly Lloyd's role within the team? And more importantly, is she happy with it? She is most often used um, as the replacement for Morgan at center forward. 
Um, there is some value there that I, I think maybe people don't see, especially because Lloyd has traditionally been a center midfielder, but Lloyd has some of those physical characteristics you want in a target forward. Yeah. Um, whether she's happy with that or not, I mean, if I would speculate no. She's made a few comments about, you know, her view from the bench um, in mixed zones over the past year. You know, <laughs> she's been a good soldier about it. She's not out there openly, you know, complaining about it. I think that's got to be a difficult position for her being a two-time, you know, world player of the year and obviously the hero of this team from 2015. But uh, she does seem to have accepted that role uh, at least as much as a, as a coach, I think, would, would hope that a player of her caliber would. Yeah, I think given what we know or think we know about Carly Lloyd's personality, that this has gone about as well as it could have gone. Yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> How about, because um, I've seen Carly Lloyd wear the captain's armband. Um, I've been reading lately that um, Becky Sauerbrunn was captain, but now that's not quite so set in stone. Um, so what is the current captaincy situation with the women's national team heading into qualifying? So Morgan has captained the team uh, of late, and I would suspect that that continues. Um, I'm assuming we were reading the same thing. It sounds like if Morgan's not on the field, it would devolve uh, to Lloyd or then to Sauerbrunn. Um, Beyond that, I couldn't tell you other than I was told um, from U.S. uh, US soccer representative over the summer that Tobin Heath is also in that captain pool uh although i don't believe we've actually seen her wear the armband um over the past year so what i'd been reading i think it was a quote from becky sauerbrunn who was basically asked about the captaincy i think she said that um they're going to go to a more i mean i i think of it as an italian style system where it's um whoever has the most caps wears the captain's armband right and that's what it sounded like to me as well and i think morgan has a handful more um than sauerbrunn right now yeah, actually, I have the roster. Um, I printed the roster out specifically for this conversation. Uh, actually, Sauerbrunn's on 143, and uh, Alex Morgan is on 147. So there you go. You, you could also guess Alex Morgan has slightly more goals as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit of uh, U.S. women's national team trivia that Sauerbrunn has not scored. Um, despite a very long career. Oh, yeah, I see the, I see the zero next to her name. Um, speaking of Sauerbrunn, um, my understanding is that the centre-backs are going to be um, still Becky Sauerbrunn, but obviously Julie Ertz, Nay Johnson, has moved into midfield, so she'll be partnered by uh, Tiana Davidson, who uh, every time I've seen Tiana Davidson, I've been really um, impressed with her. Uh, but I actually, I'm not seeing her name on the roster. Is she, is she not going to be on this roster? Yeah, she broke, I believe it was her ankle, playing for Stanford a few weeks ago. Oh, wow. I have, I have been out of the loop on that news. I apologize. So with no yeah. Tina Davidson, who is Becky Sauerbrunn's defensive partner? Abby Dalkamp? Uh, Abby Dalkamp. Yeah. Yes, that's who I suspect will start most of the games, although I, I do think there'll be some rotation just because they're playing five games in 14 days. And um, so I am not as familiar with Del Campa as I, as I was with Davidson. So what, what do we gain or lose with Del Campa replacing Tiana Davidson? I think, you know, uh, Dahl Kemper's got a little bit more experience. You know, she's been in the pros since 2015. She's won a couple of titles with the North Carolina Courage. Um, I think she's a bit uh, more physical than Davidson. Uh, She can switch the point of attack uh, just as well. I don't think she's quite as good on the ball in traffic uh, or as comfortable as she is. So I think there's a little bit of a drop off there. Which is maybe a downside given that um, at least my expectation is that the U.S. is going to have a lot of the ball um, at the CONCACAF Championship, as in will be on the attack more, more than the opposite. It might, but at the same time, I, I wouldn't suspect other teams will be pressuring the U.S. in their defensive third as much. So the ability to work out a pressure probably won't be as important as it might be next uh-huh. summer. Good point. OK, uh, the other um, player that catches my own defense, of course, is uh, Crystal Dunn. So there's been a long running thing where... Crystal Dunn is like, you know, to me up there with the best of America's attackers. And yet she finds herself playing uh, left back for the women's national team. Um, And I'm always interested to get people's takes on whether this is a smart use of a really talented player who can do a bit of everything or a waste of a good attacker. You know, I'm probably in the minority, but I do not think it's a waste um, simply because I can't think of a player 
um, in the attack that I necessarily would put Dunn in the lineup over. Okay. So if you're not, if you're not sure that she's going to start, why would you not want to take advantage of her? And she obviously has the versatility uh, to play in the back. Most people probably don't know that she has a lot of experience back there as well. She was the right back on the USU 20 team, which won the uh, World Cup in 2012. She played in the back line for North Carolina when they won a national championship. Um, so she can do it, and she's got great recovery speed, and and uh, Jill Ellis loves her fullbacks to get forward. So I think in a lot of ways that's a perfect role for Dunn. So for some reason I was assuming left back. Could she also play – is it also possible we see her play right back? Yeah, and she might even be a little bit better on the right, but they have been using her on the left. Hello, this is Daryl here cutting into my own interview to tell you about today's sponsor. Today's Total Soccer Show is sponsored by Grip. Six. If you've been listening to TSS for a while, you'll know that Grip6 is a belt manufacturer, but not just any belt manufacturer. Every Grip6 belt is made in the USA, in Draper, Utah. And it's not just any belt. This is an American innovation. All one word, innovation. Put out of your mind the sort of big, chunky, clunky belts with big buckles that you you may be wearing or you may have seen before. A Grip6 belt is a genuine innovation to produce a lightweight, low-profile belt with a grip that will not quit. I'm holding mine right now. You can't see it, obviously, but you can hear it, maybe. There you go. You can hear it. And picture, rather than a leather belt, there is a special webbing. And rather than a big buckle, there is the buckle with badger teeth. And the badger teeth grip the webbing and will not let go until you release them. I'm genuinely excited about Grip6 belts and love when they advertise because they are different. They also will offer the Total Soccer Show logo printed on your belt, laser printed, I believe, for an extra 10 what you'd have to do is you actually have to email us. If you email contact at totalsoccershow.com or Daryl, D-I-R-Y-L, at totalsoccershow.com, I will give you the file with the logo um, and then you can send it to Grip6, upload it, and they will print it onto your buckle. I think it's going to cost about an extra $10. Uh, belts in the Classic Series cost about $35. For 20% off um, any belt, you can go to grip6.com, G-R-I-P, the number 6.com. Link will be in the show notes. When you get to checkout, add the discount code TSS, three letters, TSS, for 20% off any individual belt. And I'm 100% serious about the logo offer. Email us, we'll give you the logo, and then if you take it to Grip6, uh, when, you, when you purchase, they will laser print it onto your belt buckle. So once again, it's TSS, 20% off at Grip6.com. Thank you to Grip6 for sponsoring today's show. Now, back to my interview with John. Um, okay, I want to maybe talk about the um, the opposition as well. So I am sort of expecting that the US in the group stage of the CONCACAF Championship will face something of a test, but a test that you sort of really expect to pass, like you've done all your homework um, against Mexico. And then I expect it to be kind of easy against Trinidad and Tobago um, and Panama. So am I being naive or does that sound about right to you? It does sound right to me, but um, the U.S. has struggled in the past against teams that have bunkered, and that's not just Sweden. This has happened in CONCACAF before. It happened um, in the last set of World Cup qualifiers where I think they beat, I think they beat Trinidad 1-0, um, mm-hmm. and there was another, another team that they were only up 1-0 at halftime against. So they do sometimes struggle when teams bunker in like that, um, but if they play to even half of their ability – uh, they should they should definitely walk past Panama and Trinidad. Mexico, you know, could give them a game, but the U.S. beat Mexico six to two and four to one in April. So um, again, if the U.S. plays up to their ability, they they shouldn't have any problems in the group stage. Um, this might be putting you on the spot, but when when we watch that that USA Mexico game, so that's going to be um, October fourth. Uh, it's going to be on Fox Sports two. Um, what what should we be looking out for in terms of this is going well or this is going poorly? Like, what will be the the telltale signs in the first say fifteen minutes of of how this is going? I think the number one thing that you need to watch when they play Mexico and then probably Canada in the knockout stages is how the defense does because as well as the U.S. has played over the past year, they do have a tendency to give up soft goals or goals on the counter. 
And Mexico, in two friendlies back in April, scored three goals over 180 minutes. So I think the, the U.S.'s ability to defend counters, especially if they're on the front foot early on, uh, you know, an ability to snuff those out and make sure that Mexico doesn't get in behind them is really going to be key. So what, what's a good sign? If, if Julie Ertz is stopping things with a slide tackle at midfield, then, then we're feeling good? Yeah, or if, you know, if Dahl Kemper and Sauerbrunn are keeping, keeping the opposition in front of them. You know, when, when the midfield gets sucked forward, when those outside backs go forward, you, you know, you're looking at a situation which is very similar to that Sweden game we talked about earlier, where if Becky Sauerbrunn is left on an island 1v1 on the counter, the U.S. can get hurt because as good as Sauerbrunn is, uh, she does have a lack of speed, and she can be beat for pace. Where do you rank Mexico in the world? Because in my head, they're not really ready to compete and beat a team like the US. Or I looked at their results. They lost 4-0 to France not so long ago as well. Um, but then at the same time, I also... Um, this isn't really based on any hard knowledge, but in my head, I expect them to to also beat Trinidad and Tobago and Panama quite easily. So I see them as like in this in-between space. Is that is that a fair... Um, a fair assessment of Mexico. Yeah, I would say they're probably somewhere 15 to 20 in the world. I think, you know, with the women's game, there's really uh, a set of tiers. There's your, your top four or five teams. And then everybody from six to 15 is about equal. And then you're maybe six to 20. And then after that, there's, there's a big drop off. So I think Mexico is in that middle tier where certainly against anybody else in that middle tier, uh, they can compete, and then teams in the bottom, you're right, they should dominate, I think, against Panama and Trinidad. So it's fair to say Mexico is the biggest game of the group stage, right? It's Mexico, Panama, Trinidad. So right. c- we can expect to see Jill Ellis' strongest lineup against Mexico. But then the Panama game is, what, three days later on the 7th. The Trinidad game is three days after that on the 10th. Only 20 players on the roster. Do Do you think we'll see... Maybe goalkeepers aside, because there's Harris and Naya, but maybe even that. Do you think we'll see every player play a role at some point? I think that's certainly possible, especially considering, you know, everyone on this roster um, has gotten game time recently. The one maybe X factor would be Haley Mace. Um, She's been in a lot of camps, but hasn't seen the field often. Uh, She's a younger player. She's still in college. So whether or not she plays and what role she plays will be interesting, but I do think everybody else gets on the field. So I know Haley Mace is a defender, but I don't know if she's a fullback or a centre back or, or which side. Do you know? Do you know where we could expect to see her? Well, she also occasionally plays forward in oh, college. So, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't think anybody can answer that question. Uh, it, we're going to see where Ellis wants to play her. Oh, so she's maybe a type of utility player, um, which makes then that makes sense. Her inclusion on the roster makes sense if you're only allowed twenty players. Yeah. And I think, you know, with, with Zerboni getting hurt, Davidson getting hurt, um, it kind of opened up that opportunity. Are there any other omissions, um, either through injury or just not being selected, that, that are worth noting here? Um, I don't think there's any big ones. I think that you could make an argument that Adriana French um, has perhaps outplayed Nayer or Harris uh, on the club level this year. So maybe, maybe she should be in one of those two goalkeeper spots. And I think there's an argument to be made that uh, Lynn Williams um, having another good season with the North Carolina Courage maybe should be on this roster. But I don't think those are big or obvious omissions. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of that thing where maybe you're nitpicking a little bit. Yeah. Um, but both of, them, both of them have at least made a case. So, yeah, Lynn Williams, I guess she's in competition then with Alex Morgan and Carly Lloyd. And it's really hard to, right. to break past those two. Um, I mean, I first became really aware of Adriana French um, in the playoffs, the NWSL playoffs uh, this year. Um, and I was really shocked that she had not played for the U.S. women's national team. So if you want to, I wouldn't mind talking about that just for a second. Um, my, my understanding um, is that Jill Ellis sort of after Hope Solo's retirement, question mark, or depending on how you think of what happened there, um, she just wanted to get someone experienced straight away and get someone in there. And it, I understand that doing that but doesn't it seem that Adriana France should have had an opportunity at some point over the last year or two I would say yes and I would also argue that they they probably should have given Harris more playing time over that that stretch um they're putting all of their eggs in one basket right now and that might not be the best strategy heading into a big tournament and Nayer has certainly had some moments uh that have 
made people question whether or not she should be the number one. Now, Ellis has a decision. She's decided to stick with her. So maybe that gives Mayer some more confidence. But at the same time, there's a risk involved with that in that you don't have somebody ready to step in if a change needs to be made or if, um, you know, heaven forbid, something happens to Mayer on the health front. Has Janelis ever sort of really explained why Naya above everybody else? Um, Not in a way that I think would please people. Um, I think she's just kind of said that she's better, uh, that she's the number one. There was sort of an open competition in the fall of 2016 where they were rotating them on a pretty consistent basis, but um, Ellis always seemed to favor Nair in the more difficult games during that time period. So I think even then, Ellis had already kind of made up her mind or at least had decided at that point that Nair was her number one. Looking beyond uh, the group stage, um, I'm going to sort of assume that the the way we expect this to go is US versus Canada in the final. Does that, does that sound about right? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then if we if we do get there, I think October 17th, I think the, the game would be, um, is... It's always that weird thing, right? If you get to the final, you've already qualified for the Women's World Cup. Um, so the, the key part is done. But then how seriously does that championship game get taken? You know, I don't... If, if I've spent a little bit of time around this team over the past few years, and they take everything seriously <laughs> uh, when, when it comes to these games. They don't take games off. Like I said, they haven't lost a game in 15 months. Um, and, you know, part of that is because when they do lose, people freak out. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, we were talking earlier about that, you know, supposed player revolution after that loss um, in, in July of 2017. Tom Sermani didn't last very long after he had one bad tournament in Portugal back in 2014. Um, so I think everybody from top down, they take it seriously. And the U.S.-Canada rivalry um, has some bitterness to it from the past. So I think both of those teams will be taking it very seriously. Of course. I was counting to five with my, my fingers as you, as you said that. Um, what are you um, what are you hoping to see through the course of qualification? I mean, obviously qualification, uh, but what what are you, anything in particular that you'll be looking for uh, during these next what hopefully five games? I really want to see how the U.S. back line handles counterattacks, um, especially against these teams that bunker in, because some of these Concacaf teams um, will have some pace up top. They might not have a lot of quality overall, but they will. Uh, you know, three, four times a game, be able to play a ball long. And I really want to see how the U.S. center backs handle those because I really do think that that is the one weakness of this team right now. And is that is that a problem with just uh, switching off because the U.S. is on the attack so much? I mean, is it a problem with particular players? Why do you think that that's happening? Well, I think for one, I think when Ertz holds, the back line is very solid because she's the one who's kind of breaking up plays before they happen. But she also likes to go forward, and she does score uh, you know, a fair amount of goals for a holding mid. So mm-hmm. I think when she goes forward, there's that space in front of the center backs that opens up, and they get caught in these 1v1 situations where you know, through give and goes or if the opponent can bring that third attacker forward and the U.S.'s outside backs have gone into the attack where they're very briefly in a numbers-down situation. And when teams attack with pace, I do think that they struggle – uh, both for pace and in figuring out how to trade off those marks, shift ball side, uh, and prevent those opportunities. Uh, I've got, I think I've got a lot of sympathy because if the U.S. don't send players forward, then they get accused of not committing enough numbers to the attack against a team that's bunkering. But then when you do that, you're always likely to get caught out. So I guess it's really about sort of fine-tuning, right? So is that what you're telling me, that you're looking for the fine-tuning of how to send numbers forward, but also... Uh, know how to protect yourself yeah and i think you know watching um watching them at the tournament of nations last summer when Ertz first started playing that holding midfield position she stayed a little bit deeper um i think over the evolution of the past year she started to drift forward and i think some of that is by design i'm not sure why but you see her pushing forward and at times that midfield three is playing flatter than they used to and I think if they keep her home they still have the ability then to send those outside backs forward with abandon because they still have three holding between the two center backs and Ertz 
and Ertz's ability to break up a play plus her instincts, you know, from those years when she did play center back, allow her uh, to help out in those situations much more. But when she gets pushed forward, they do expose themselves. So there's really a, finding that balance in sending those numbers forward to break down bunkers, but at the same time being pragmatic enough to realize that it's a 90 minute game and you don't need to score, you know, right off the bat. And if a team is bunkering back, it's okay to, to have some patience and wait them out a little bit before kind of uh, going forward with abandon. All right. Yeah. That all makes sense to me. I think you've also really um, helped me get more excited for the games that I thought the U S was going to walk through. I think this is, um, this gives me a thing to look for, even if the U S ends up beating Trinidad four 0 you know what I'm saying? Or I guess in the past only one nil. <laughs> um, all right, John, is there anything I haven't asked about that's like really pertinent to the to the U.S. Women's National Team and the CONCACAF Championship? I want to make sure I haven't sort of left any ground uncovered through my own ignorance. No, I think I think you've done a good job. I think um, you know one of the other things I'd be looking for is to see how fit Kelly O'Hara is. She hasn't played a full ninety uh, since the spring, so you know if the U.S. can get back her her back in the rotation, uh, that's something to watch. And then how Ellis manages the roster because five games in 14 days is very difficult uh, regardless of the opponent. Oh, yeah, you mentioned um, Kelly O'Hara. I guess that's the only position, uh, just accidentally, the only position we didn't talk about was uh, right back. Is, is Kelly O'Hara the presumed starter? If she's fit, I think so. You know, the nice part is, is they have options. Uh, Emily Sonnet has played there a lot over the past six months um, when O'Hara was hurt. And I that has given them the freedom to do some different things, especially with Dunn. They allowed Dunn to go a little bit further forward because Emily Sonnet is naturally a center back. So she yeah. kind of tucks into the weak space um, to cover that. But I'm excited. And I think other people should be to see if they start Dunn and O'Hara at the same time and how that, how that shakes out. Got it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so John, Thank you for, for coming on the show, talking U.S. Women's National Team with me. Um, if people want to find more of your work, what's the best place to find you? Uh, just on Twitter. That's usually where I post most of the articles that I write. Okay, I'll put a link to your Twitter profile in the show notes. Do, do you make appearances on other podcasts? I, I did a quick search and found you um, on an Equalizer podcast, but it was behind a paywall. So I wondered if you were, if you were ever on any other podcasts. Yep, that uh, we've we've done some stuff um, with Sports Illustrated. I was on Grant Wall's podcast uh, earlier uh, this fall, and uh, occasionally on the Mix Zone with uh, Jen Cooper as well. All right, Jen Cooper, the keeper. Yes. <laughs> All right, John. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. 